Tokyo, largest urban agglomeration in the world. Its population exceeds that of Canada, and that's not counting the millions of workers who flock in every morning. Everything here is based on public transit. Everybody has to go through Shinjuku to go to work, or to pass through Tokyo to go to northern regions or to the south, to Osaka, for example. Space in Tokyo is scarce and precious. And every idea to make more with less is welcome with open arms. Uh, one and a half meters by one and a half meters, <laughs> much larger than a coffin. <laughs> Capital of a country that was closed to the world for more than 300 years, it evolved away from Western influences. Early on, it created its own unique culture, which still defines it today. Back around the time George Washington was getting elected president, Japan had a completely thriving publishing industry, a performing arts industry, a book industry. Tokyo is bustling, day and night. And more than New York, this is... Tokyo It was a very important city in the mid-1700s. We estimate that the uh, city was the largest city in the world in terms of population. And Tokyo was the capital of Japan that has decided to isolate from, from the rest of the world. What's very unique is that Japan decided to close itself off from the rest of the world. Yes, the ports were banned. The foreign merchants were banned in Japan, except Dutch people that were authorized in the west of Japan. And uh, it was very, very controlled. Uh, and the country went on like that during 300 years until the Commodore Perry float arrived and forced the country to, to open to, to international commerce. How could an American expedition forced Tokyo to open itself to the world. I think it was happening in the 19th century. The, the Commodore arrived with the, the, the black ships. The idea was very simple. Either Japan should uh, open to the world or they would be facing the uh, risk of a war with the rest of the world. And to support the uh, assumption, Commodore Perry bombed one of the uh, small towns in Japan. And of course, Japanese military forces were totally unable to oppose anything to these modern weapons. And the uh, following year, when Commodore Perry returned to get the answer from the Shogun, whether they would agree or not to open the, the country, of course, the country accepted to, uh, to foreign commerce. And you can't help it if Japan is not populated by immigrants. 98% of the population of Japan is Japanese. Definitely, it's not a country where uh, immigration has been massive or important or encouraged. I mean, no external push for change made that, and that's probably unique in this sense in Japan, that all changes were made internally by a, a society that recreated a diversity inside Japan. Uh, so Japan was isolated, but between North and South of Japan, uh, the languages, the culture, the food references are different. But that's very interesting to see that maybe humans need some diversities after all. And, and that's the case also in Tokyo, where you will find people coming from those di different regions in, uh, in Japan and uh, living in the, uh, in, in the city. In Tokyo, there's a strong sense of responsibility and hierarchy in the workplace. Yes, I think people want to have the things done uh, right. Many things in Japan are codified, they are organized. They do the things as they should be done. Uh, and that's true in the, in the work life particularly. But of course, the human relationship after that are also very important. And uh, the relationship between uh, superiors and people in, in, in teams are very personal relationship. And here it gets all mixed up because after work, all the colleagues, sometimes the boss, they go out together and they spend a lot of after hours fraternizing. Well, after hard work, you need to spend some time together to know each other and, uh, and work uh, better in uh, having a stronger relationship inside the, inside the company. Personal relationship is important. Is work more important than family? Well, I think that emphasizes a lot of importance on, on everything. Uh, what, what is true is that, of course, the uh, work is taking a huge uh, part of the time for both genders. It doesn't facilitate, of course, the, uh, the family life. Do you think that this explains the sagging birth rate here in Japan? Well, if we look at, uh, at numbers, it's, uh, it's quite impressive. There are approximately 130 million uh, Japanese living in Japan today. 
And it is expected that by the middle of this of the century, 2050, uh, number will go to 80 million, uh, and potentially 50 million at the end of the century. Uh, so it will be probably a very different Japan uh, that we will see in 20 years from now, but maybe not so different from the Japan of the 70s, 60s or 50s. Japan was, after all, 80 million inhabitants uh, in the middle of the uh, uh, 20th century, just coming back to what, what Japan was in the, in the previous century. <laughs> Tokyo has always been a big city. Uh, it's always been a megalopolis. Yeah, yeah. It's always been big. It used to be a, a million, million inhabited city, like when London and Paris was only like half a million. In daily basis on the west side of Tokyo, where people could kind of come in from the suburbs, you would have over like 20 to 30 million commuters coming into the city daily. So it's like eight times of Hong Kong, just on the move, eight o'clock in the morning. The entire city is based on public transport. You have around 30 train operators and 120 lines, different lines. Tokyo is immense. It's made up of wards and districts yeah. and villages and municipalities. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the kind of the legal boundaries are there like any other city, I think. But then you have all these kind of quite small communities. Not small, I mean. We're talking big, but but still, like in, in the Intimate. scale. Yeah, well, in the scale of Tokyo, you you have all these kind of uh, small communities that that then make the patchwork of, of the entire city. It's made of uh, 23 wards, and every ward has a kind of a, a city hall, and every ward also has a, a mayor. Th those 23 wards uh, make part of the, the kind of the, the central Tokyo. In addition to these 23 wards. Tokyo encompasses 26 cities, three towns, one village, and several islands. If you look on yeah. a satellite map, yeah. basically you see yeah, it's city after city all right. the way to yeah. Yokohama. It doesn't yeah. stop. Yeah, it doesn't stop at Yokohama either, so it just kind of flows <laughs> down. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the only place where it stops is uh, at, this, at the kind of waterfront. But like west, you, you, can, you can travel endlessly. Uh, on a train that travels quite fast and it's just building, build, like just housing and buildings. And then you hit the mountains and, and still there's like a lot of housing, so. There's not one major center in Tokyo. Yeah. Is it comprised of many downtowns? Yeah, many downtowns or many cities. Every major train station, which uh, would kind of encompass uh, what I call a, 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 kind of a community or a city. Rebuilt after a destructive earthquake in 1923, and again after the bombings of World War II, Tokyo doesn't have the vertical aspect generally found in large cities. But you also understand that it's, it's actually quite uh, low rise. It's not the image of New York, for example, or Chicago, or these kind of uh, American cities, or even Shanghai, where there's lots of high rise. Is that because of the seismic condition of the city? Historically, pr probably one, one reason. The, the other reason is that it's just kind of an organic city that just kind of grew larger and larger. And, uh, there was a rule to kind of keep uh, buildings low. Um, and then I think private developers also kind of suggest maybe we should uh, make them higher because it's more feasible for business. And, and so they kind of propose, let's, let's build a higher Tokyo. And actually the, the Roppongi Hills that we stand uh, on now uh, was one of the kind of starting points where Tokyo started to uh, move inwards, making being more compact. Now we can see high-rise buildings kind of just like mushrooms coming up. Tokyo being so densely populated has yeah. the lowest average living space per yeah. person. Yeah, it's quite tight, yeah. The quality of life, I wouldn't say goes down too much um, because it's small, right? People feel like I'd rather go to a neighborhood uh, store which is conveniently next to me rather than going to a shopping mall or, or having to you know, take the bus or dri even drive to a, a, a supermarket. It's the biggest city on earth, but it's yeah. still a, it's, at a human scale. Yeah, yeah, it's very human scale. And, and um, it, you can, if, you, if you like a neighborhood, you, you can also just be in that neighborhood and, and, and not, not go to all these kind of major hubs, if you like. I would say, yeah. Has the preservation of historic buildings been a challenge? Um, I think preservation is quite a, um, 
different concept maybe in Asia, also in Japan. I heard the lifespan of an average building is 26 years. Yeah, I've been away now for about half a year, right? Um, I come back, feels like what, what Europe does in maybe five years happens in six months. So, <laughs> so there's a lot of new things, but also a lot of things disappear. Now we're reaching um, the part where you see down, down to Yokohama. Yeah. And you see this massive um, highway. Olim yeah, this highway going all the way through Shibuya and then down, down to Yokohama. Behind its oversized avenues, Tokyo hides another reality. A few steps from the busiest intersections in the world lies a surprising intimacy, not unlike what you'd find in a small village. So it's surprising you can be in the middle of a busy neighborhood and yeah. then all of a sudden turn the corner and find a charming alleyway. You have a local public school here and then on the other side you have someone's house and then uh, fashion shops. It's lively in this uh, small little alleyways. Yeah. The street address system here in Tokyo yeah. is very different than in yeah. the rest of the world. Yeah, you don't have street, necessarily street names actually. You have the name of the block. You have the name of the block or numbering of the block. And then the, the house number is based on, uh, on the, the order of which, uh, when, when it was uh, built. So the house numbers aren't necessarily consecutive? No, no, definitely not. It would be quite a... Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, it's a coincidence if that would happen, but if, if you tell a cab driver, taxi driver, where, you know, how to get here, usually, nowadays, of course, they use all this GPS technology, but traditionally, you would direct by landmarks. So, uh, university buildings or other kind of uh, public or big, big institutions, perhaps, and then from there, you would kind of scale down to, to where you want to go. So, is it functional? Well, it, it's not dysfunctional. I mean, it works. It's, it's one of the, the big, bigger cities in the world, and the mail, mail, post, everything comes to your home. I heard that cars drive an average of 18 kilometers an hour. Yeah, I think that's, that, that's perfect. Every, every city should learn from this. I mean, it's cause and effect, but I think when, when cars are driving slow, it means that actually that people are um, opting public transport in, 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 instead of maybe private, private cars. Moving millions of people in all directions every day is nothing short of an art in Tokyo. But everything works perfectly, above ground and underground. The population here is around 35 million people, the size of Canada itself. So all concentrated in one city. I'm a person of crowds and I like particularly this crowd because everybody is respecting each other. You can be as many as we are now and nobody's touching each other and if, if you accidentally do then you, you say sorry and everything so it's very respectful. This is one of the busiest neighborhood in the world I would say because at the this station Shinjuku station is the station that it's the um, the entrance to the cities other neighborhoods all the west part of the city Everybody has to go through Shinjuku to go to work or to pass through Tokyo to go to northern regions or to the south, to Osaka, for example. The majority of Tokyoites use public transport. In Tokyo, you don't even ask yourself if you're going to take your car or any other transportation than the train. It's the natural way to move in the town. Because near your house, there will be a train station or a subway station. It's just so efficient, so... It is efficient. And there will be no traffic, and you will get on time within very maximum an hour to your workplace. And you know that you'll be there on time, and it will be easier than take any other kind of transportation. You know, it, it, it's a natural way to be here. Do you know just how many people use the metro every year? Well, I think I heard it was 3.2 billion people who are passing through all the subway stations and the train stations in, in Tokyo. 
And this area is more the entertainment district. You have restaurants, cinemas, and whatever. It, that's the part of the city that lives 24 hours a day. And you see the buildings, they have shops, like up to eight, nine floors, but you, you have at least three floors downstairs as well. And all those buildings are full of people. 24 hours a day. Restaurants. So, and yeah, restaurants, karaoke, boxes, and, and uh, everything. If you want to go to eat Indian food at 5 o'clock in the morning, there's a restaurant, or French food at 3 o'clock, or uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning, you want to go have a scotch or a whiskey, then you have a place here. Even you can go your, your grocery shopping at 5 o'clock in the morning if you want. So it's a convenience that is here. It's a rotation of people the whole day. It's not only one downtown area, it's like so many around the city and every area has a particular style, a particular um, way of, of doing things too. Even in, in your clothes, you, you dress differently when you go somewhere else. So when you kind of catch what Tokyo is, then you, you use it at, at its best. And when you want to get to this style, then you go to Ginza. If you want to get, I don't know, more with foreigners, you go to Ropongi. Uh, if you want to uh, go where all the young people are, you go to Shibuya. And when you master it, it's, it's really fun to, uh, to live here. This building here in, this, in the middle of the entertainment district of Shinjuku, the Shinjuku City Hall. Yeah. This building is right here in the middle of all this. And what is particular here is there is a small entrance just right there and you can get married at the time of the day that you wish. You just go downstairs with your papers written and you give it to the security guard and he puts the stamp and says, congratulations, you're married. And Tokyo hides intriguing secrets like this around every corner. This is one of the hidden places in Tokyo. One of my good friends who was born in Tokyo doesn't, well, didn't know about this golden guy place. And when I took him here, he was so surprised that it was a foreigner who introduced him to this place. <laughs> golden guy used to be a neighborhood of prostitution. Now it's turned into a small bar neighborhood but the structure itself it's all it's all small little buildings all together yeah. for example here so you had a little bar where people would, would drink and on the second floor there were tatami rooms where the prostitutes would be the first purpose was to, to just have the client to uh, to have a drink before they would go upstairs so all those places can have maybe four or five people maximum ten people for the big ones but they're so small, it, that's the, the charm of those little bars. And I think now there are 250 small bars just in this neighborhood. Although they take work extremely seriously, many Tokyoites tend to go heavy on the celebrating. We go out mostly with colleagues and with our bosses. Outside the office, we can be more relaxed and friendly with superiors. And in general, we go out only with men. But women do the same on their side. They go out with their female co-workers. And nights out on the town often finish very late. When the subway closes, things can get a little complicated. Taxis in Tokyo are extremely expensive. If you live outside the city, it can cost 70 or $80 just to get home. So you should never miss the last train. But people do miss the last subway. And when that happens, capsule hotels are the way to freshen up before heading right back to the office. It's convenient, it's clean, it isn't something that's frowned upon. And it's cheap compared to luxury hotels. 
Now here it is, a capsule hotel in Shimbashi. The price changes depending on the time. You have the super relax, which is between noon and 9 p.m. If you have free time between business meetings, you can relax in this kind of capsule hotel. There's the midnight special, but you can also spend the night. The whole night costs only 2,500 yen, so about uh, $30. So there are two rows. It's big enough, one and a half meters by one and a half meters. Much larger than a coffin. It's like a little nest. The buttons are for air conditioning, light, and to turn on the television. Tokyoites don't pile up only in hotels. Maximizing the use of small spaces is just a part of everyday life here. Whether you're playing golf or planning a karaoke career. Karaoke is kara, which means empty, and oke, which means orchestra. So karaoke actually means empty orchestra. Everyone expresses themselves through karaoke, and many people train quite a bit in solo cubicles. Let's go to cubicle number six. There are many cubicles here. This is karaoke for one person. First, choose the songs. Everything is clean, already disinfected. You just take the microphone. Ah, 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 ah. It works. One, two, three, four. There are also restaurants, even in this upscale neighborhood, that use small spaces, like noodle shops. This is a ramen restaurant. We just need to buy tickets here. You can add extra toppings, but the main dish here is ramen. When the light is on, it means the seats are available. These seats are reserved for families, and these are reserved for women. Okay. You can choose very fat, less fat, normal, okay. with garlic, a little garlic, no garlic. Then you only need to push this button. Hello, welcome to our restaurant. We have your order. They just confirmed your order. Wait a minute or two, if you please. Thank you. Merci. Yeah, it is good. Mm. 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 It's good. Mm. Building in Tokyo is no simple task. Coping with the lack of space is one thing, but building on one of the most active seismic zones in the world poses serious challenges. Are most houses now in Tokyo being built earthquake resistant? Yes. Japan is an earthquake country. So every day somewhere, the small earthquake occurs. Or, and sometimes big one comes. We have had for the earthquake resistant buildings, but normal earthquake resistant building is not enough for the big, big earthquake. Nowadays, the different technology is coming up. The common concept is to reduce the shake of the earthquake with the rubber isolator or even a ball bearing. Kind of like a shock absorber? Yeah, exactly. When the earthquake comes, the base shakes a lot, but uh, the upper building doesn't shake much. Latest technology is called the uh, air isolated system. When the earthquake comes, the system responds and put the air 
to the space between the base and upper building to make the building float up or lift up so the house doesn't move. Is it much more expensive to build a house with such technique? It depends which technology, but uh, average about 50% uh, more. Whatever the case, witty architecture and organization of private space have always been a priority here. You know what I find incredible? The fact that there are so many pedestrian walkways. Yeah. It makes it so intimate. Around here, originally the house is very, very small, like this. You can see the, how people live here, like that. You see the clothing up there. Uh, you hear the noise of the living. It's so quiet, it's hard to believe we're in a big city like Tokyo. People try to not make noise because you hear neighbors, so it means neighbor can hear you. So people try to be quiet. And respectful. Yeah. Is this the front of the house or the back of the house? This is the front of the house. Look at these plants. So the land is very small. So this house doesn't have a garden or you know, green amenity. They put the planters in front of the building and enjoy the gardening. But at the same time, you can, you can enjoy walking on the street like this, you know. Beautiful. The complexities of the city aren't about to slow anyone down. Everyone wants to live in Tokyo even if that means adapting to homes that would be considered too small in most parts of the world. The result? Miniature houses called Kyosho Jutaku are popping up everywhere in the city. These are one of the very good solutions for those who are looking for the affordable housing in the middle of the Tokyo. Are they very widespread? Can you find them everywhere? Almost everywhere, like the, uh, the big uh, property use, uh, usually divided into some parts to sell the uh, cheaper price. They measure a lot on how many tatamis you can fit in an area, right? Yeah, yeah. This area is three tatami. One tatami, two tatami. Usually 4.5 tatami and six tatamis and eight tatamis are very popular space. So this is um, the, the tatami room and what could it be used for? Musha-san, for her mother Hi. to stay. What are tricks to maximizing space in such small apartments? For the new construction, I, I encourage the owner to discard most of the unusual things. That's it, the trick, eh? To have less stuff. Yeah. Hello. I just made a room. Oh. <laughs> or her, her sake <laughs> cave. Sake <laughs> sake. This is not mine. How big is your house? Would you have whole meter? In total, uh, 50 square meters. On all three floors? Yeah, yeah. total. Total size. Okay. Okay. Please, please. So this is the second floor, and it's your kitchen dining room. And this is the, we're sitting on the floor. Now they're the party. They sit on the floor in the, during the yeah. party. Yeah. Uh, when, when, they, when it's uh, too many people. Too many people. So there's a fridge in the freezer. <laughs> Can I take a look? Hi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, and you have your, your washer dryer machine? A dryer machine? No. No, you have a washing machine and you dry outside. Is privacy an issue when you're stuck against your neighbor? Yeah. There is a trick about installing the window, location of the window. Also, they are installing the, this kind of louver screen to prevent from the eyesight from their neighbors. The point is to make the space 
not open for outside, but uh, make the space open inside to make the space looks bigger. Like this with the glass, you don't you don't split the space with the wall. Then you can see the space bigger and the high ceiling too. Is a loft on the fourth floor? So you can sleep more people up here. Mm, yeah. I think I'd like to take a picture up here. Nice view. When you have a city as big as Tokyo, if it's not efficient, it's going to grind to a complete halt. It's on a scale that's quite unlike anywhere else in the world in a, in for a first world city. And I think it's uh, really telling that the people here are able to live in, in relative peace and harmony with one another, given how uh, closely packed that they are. Space is at a premium in this city, right? So it's really frowned upon to just park your bike anywhere and leave it. So has it been there for a while? Did it get three tickets? Apparently, this guy has been there for a while. So where are you supposed to park your bike in Tokyo? This is EcoCycle, and this is a automatic bike parking lot. And what happens is you stick your bike into one of these machines and it whisks it away to a subterranean <laughs> bike parking facility. Each bike is equipped with a uh, a little microchip sensor. And when you want your bike back, you use this card to get it back. But first, you have to stick it in. So why don't you give it a try? All right. Stick it so the wheel is, goes in through that door. Now step away from the bike okay. and hit that green button. This giant robot arm basically whisks your bike down into this huge tube. And the tube is about 11 meters deep and it holds about 200 bicycles. So e there's five of these machines here. Normally, you would never be able to park 1,000 bikes in this space. Maybe you'd get 100 in if you were lucky, and it would be incredibly cluttered, and if there's wind, they fall over, and rain gets on them. How much does it cost to park your bike? Well, the way it works here is that you have to pay a monthly fee. This is like a monthly rental fee. I would say about $22 US. And how about if we want to get it back? Let's start with mine. All you got to do is swipe your card here, And let's time that. Here we go. I can hear the machine moving. 12 seconds. <laughs> Look at that. 12 seconds. There are car parking lots that actually let you move your car in and they'll park them underground for you just like this. Automatic. You press a button and it's whisked away. This is Japanese, I guess you could say, urban technology at its absolute finest. I mean, where else are you gonna see something like this? Where you, you, you squeeze hundreds of cars into the same space that would, you normally only be able to park two or three. Special effects. That's that's technology <laughs> for you. To me, Tokyo is filled with eccentricity, but eccentricity here is a form of creativity, whereas in the West, it would be looked at as marginality. What I think Tokyo is all about is about coming up with the most pragmatic solution to a problem. That's why you see so many things here that are, by foreign standards, either incredibly high-tech or even whimsical. You know, like a heated toilet seat, right? You know, everybody agrees that's a good thing to have in the middle of the winter, but I mean, we certainly don't have them in America. I'm not sure how it is in Canada. That's a very sort of like Japanese I have not seen problem. That. Yeah, exactly. Tokyo seems so gimmicky, and people from the West would think it's just plain weird. 
Well, hey man, if being weird is wrong, I don't want to be right. You know, like I think once again, weirdness is in the eye of the beholder. Weirdness is in is all in context. And when you take these things in the context of Japanese culture, when you take them in the context of this city, they make perfect sense. Going in the house with your shoes on. I mean, when you really start thinking about it, is it weird to take your shoes off? You know, I mean, it's obviously dirty outside. You want to keep your home clean. I'm a big believer in taking off your shoes. I mean, that, <laughs> that transports across the ocean, for yeah, sure. Yeah, definitely. Pushed to the extreme, social differences can generate original things. Otaku culture is one of them. Otaku are Japanese geeks and hobbyists, basically. And they are what you would call nerds abroad. And so what you'll see in Akihabara is, like you can see right in front of us here, it is just absolutely full of this uh, animation and comic book styled imagery. Why are the Japanese so obsessed with anime? Well, this is, Japan is a, has, has a, a very long uh, visual tradition historically speaking. Like back in the 1800s, they had woodblock prints. Before that, they had paintings. And there's always been a very strong tradition of visual design here. And in modern times, that manifests itself in the form of product design. You know, like in the 80s, we had the Walkman, uh, things like that. And more recently, in the form of comic books and animation and things like that. So, but Japan has had like a thriving pop culture since the 1600s. You know, back around the time a guy named George Washington was getting elected president, Japan had a completely thriving publishing industry, a performing arts industry, a book industry, periodicals, publications, all sorts of things like that. And so, when you talk about manga and you talk about anime now as, as being modern things, they are, but they have this, these roots in traditional Japanese culture. In the West, comic books have traditionally been seen as sort of kid stuff, but in Japan, that hasn't really been the case. And they have honed manga into this visual art form that many people, including myself, believe is among the best in the world. Cartoon characters are so predominant here. There are certain characters that the government use for tax purposes, for example. Isn't there a blue robot? Oh, I mean, there, there is literally a mascot and a character for everything in Japan. And it's really interesting because in the West, using cute mascots might be seen as kind of condescending. But here in Japan, it's part of the fabric of everyday life. There is a fetishness of all things cute here. Yes, and that kind of cuteness is what drives this. It's kind of a combination of cuteness and this animistic tradition that Japan has, this belief that the world, that spirits can inhabit uh, even inanimate objects. And so it kind of gives rise to a sense where if you have a product, you can put a face on it and it can advertise itself. So characters in Japan, mascot characters, are kind of mediators. Mediators in the everyday existence. They try to help you through complicated things like instruction manuals or help you make a decision as to which product to buy. That's the role that cute mascot characters play in Japanese society. Here's a perfect example here of Japanese vending machines that vend things other than the, the soft drinks and teas that you might be used to. What are these like little dolls on top of the this noodle is, cans? This is canned ramen right here. Okay. And this is canned odem, which is a kind of uh, Japanese stew. So you have these other forms of, of food that are vended out of vending machines that you normally wouldn't see in the West, wet things, so to speak. These are just standard vending machines here, but really there's vending machines for all sorts of things in Japan. Like uh, in certain places, you'll see vending machines for underwear, for like if you've been out all night, you need to get clean underwear, undershirts and things like that. And ties. Ties, exactly. Um, there's vending machines for alcohol, even full bottles of whiskey. And lettuce machines? <laughs> yes, there's actually vegetable vending machines. There's vegetable vending machines, there's, there's magazine vending machines, even book vending machines. How did vending machines become so omnipresent? Well, once again, I think we're touching on the whole efficiency thing. It's an efficient way of vending stuff that is really cheap and really simple, and you don't really need a lot of interaction to sell somebody a, a soft drink. This isn't, this isn't like a kind of, this isn't brain surgery. You know, and so using a vending machine is the is the logical way of getting the most product to the people who need it the most quickly. You can even find intelligent vending machines that analyze their clients using cameras. Blend that in with the time of day and current weather, and you can have a tailor-made offer from a machine. That's efficiency for you. Just like the standing sushi counters designed for a quick but nutritional meal. 
Chutoro. Chutoro. Oh, how is it? Mm. How is it? It's good stuff, huh? See, and that's the thing. You know, just because this is fast food doesn't mean they necessarily have to lower the quality level, right? It's fast, fresh food. Exactly. And, you know, these guys are still fully trained sushi chefs. The food comes from the fish come from the same place, but it's offered in this much faster way. And normally, a sushi bar, a sushi restaurant, is a kind of sit-down, slow food experience. But this has been kind of sped up for people who are on the go. And if there's one thing you don't want to miss in Tokyo, it's definitely fish. The Japanese are the largest consumers of fish in the world. They eat fish almost every meal. The average Japanese fish consumption is about 70 kilos a year. The Japanese catch 15% of the world's fish. It's no wonder the biggest fish market in the world is in Tokyo. It is said that the Tsukiji fish market employs more than 60,000 people. The industry revolves around quantity and quality. The Tsukiji fish market is called the kitchen of Tokyo, but it's also a very high quality market. So most sushi restaurants and the most famous sushi restaurants come to buy their fish here and nowhere else. We're going to this sushi restaurant. It's called Kaiten Sushi, sushi on a revolving conveyor belt. The plates move around like that, so whatever looks good you can just take. At the end of the meal, the cost is calculated based on the color of the plates. There are expensive and cheap plates. If you look here, you can see the price of each plate. Ah, oui. Good choice. Kampai. Kampai. There's an electronic chip inside the plate that is detected by the device. But there is more to Tokyo than rotating sushi. We make our way to Ginza, where we find the greatest sushi chefs in the world. This is shark skin. Never use a real wasabi in a foreign country Japanese restaurant, a foreign restaurant of a Japanese. Never use real wasabi. Imitation. Just so you know, there are more Michelin stars in Tokyo than in all European capitals combined. This is because it's a very large city and there are so many restaurants. They're everywhere. In some neighborhoods, restaurants are on the third, fourth, or fifth floor. They can even be in basements, and the quality is always there. Freshness is very important. <laughs> very fresh. <laughs> Massive and impressive on the surface, Tokyo can be scary at first glance. Streets and restaurants are bursting at the seams 24 hours a day. But behind the facade, Tokyo is no less than an oasis of small neighborhoods and hidden secrets, with plenty of space for family life. <laughs> 